Hello and welcome to a, another episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we get into this week's episode, I want to let you guys know that if you would like to support Fork Full of Noodles and DIY socially conscious comedy content, you can donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Everything starts at only $2 a month, so go to patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha to find out all the details, the different tiers, the rewards, and the goals of what you'd be supporting. All right, now let's dive into this week's episode. We have delved into what it takes to make prison a better place that is focused on rehabilitation, reforming the laws, and rehumanizing inmates. But that's only half the issue in this case. Look, if we make the conditions of prisons better but don't actually treat citizens with some respect or kindness in the eyes of the law, then we're starting to cycle all over again. So the question is, can we reform the officers of the law? So before we dive into this, we have to ask, can cops even be reformed, right? Can big beefy dudes who uh, seem to be looking for all the wrong reasons to get into a Wild Wild West style shootout to gain some some badge of honor and, and some coolness points, can, can they be reformed to protect and serve? Well, the example that we can look at here is Captain Ray Lewis. Captain Ray Lewis is a former Philadelphia brutal cop turned Occupy supporter. Okay, first I want to make clear that I am a retired Philadelphia police captain. I'm no longer active. And I first came to uh, align myself with the Occupy movement back in uh, November 2011, shortly after it started, when I read on the, on the newscast that these people were shouting, yelling, and screaming, and that they had a camp in New York City. And that intrigued me. Why are all these people sleeping out in these blue tarps and living like this? And so uh, after a lot of search on the internet, because mainstream media did not have it, the internet, I found a link to the Declaration of the Occupation. It was beautifully written, very descriptive. There were 23 bullet points, and after reading each one, I agreed with it wholeheartedly. There was not a single one that I took issue with. According to Captain Ray Lewis, he saw what the job itself would do to a person. Right, the job of being a cop will harden you since all you do is deal with the shitty things society has to offer. So, a police brutality. I was a brutal cop. And I, I have to let people know that the occupation is such that it hardens you very quickly. I was a ghetto cop 19 or 24 years. My first 10 years were patrol officer in the ghetto. I started out as a real nice, sensitive, caring guy. I was beating people within a year, year and a half. Uh, it breeds that because every day, and I was a sensitive guy. Can you imagine what an insensitive guy getting the job would do? How fast? Every day you run into hostility. Every day you're confronting people who are angry with you. You have to arrest them. So they're, they're upset. They're going to fight you. They spit at you. Every police department has this saying, by the way. There are two types of citizens, two types of people, cops and assholes. That, become, that comes about because that's all cops deal with. They lose sense of the real world. In the ghetto. In the ghetto. I have to make that distinction. After the eighth drunk guy pees on you, your head is going to equate that everyone wants to pee on you. But you can counter this point very easily with something that Jeff Sessions said recently about pulling away from investigating police officers in regards to perjury. Sessions claims that we shouldn't condemn law enforcement because of the actions of a few rotten apples. Great. Can uh, law enforcement make that distinction with citizens that they should be protecting? At current, citizens and law enforcement are fed the narrative that there are only a few bad apples. And I'm sure that there are a lot more Captain Ray Lewis's in the force, but usually they're pushed out, right? Even Captain Ray Lewis got threats from the Philly Commissioner's Office that they will take any actions necessary to stop him from going to the Occupy movement. They can't do anything to a retired officer, although they tried with me. They tried to take my pension. And the police commissioner, then Charles Ramsey, sent me a very threatening letter that I still have, threatening to take any and all 
necessary action to stop me. So there were threats, even though I had always legally right to do what I did. As it sounds like somebody's getting desperate that their dirty little secrets will take away their position of power. Look, people would be a lot quieter if the act if this was the actions of a few rotten apples, right? But the problem is that the rot is spreading, and apparently it spreads so deep that it's decomposing the Department of Justice. Besides, you should be looking at how bad the rot is, right? It's the quality of the rot, not the quantity. You know, eating one bad apple can make people distrust apple trees forever. Unless, of course, the apple tree can help with the decrease of the rotting. But this is the psychology of cops that isn't addressed by the system they serve. The way they, the cops look at the world around them is that it's a constant war for law and order. And according to NYU professor Urban Younger, the cops are fighting a war on two fronts. Crime on the streets and the liberal rule of law. So... To them, reforming and rehabilitating prisoners is putting crime back on the streets because that's how the system they are protecting has educated them. So if the cops are looking at the citizens as their enemy in a war and they're hardened by the job of seeing the worst society has to offer, why not help the cops see a little light in society? Right, A system that is willing to drown its own protectors in PTSD to drive chaos in the streets under the guise of law and order has failed everyone. Not just we the people and the cops, but it's failed itself too. Man, this system is like the epitome of self-hate. You know, some somebody should really get this system some counseling. But this idea uh, that cops would need mandatory mental health counseling based on the job description itself is looked down on, right? According to the president of the Fraternal Order of Police, they suggest a shot and a beer. And subsequently for me, you combat that problem but first by hiring very caring people. But even like I said with me, <laughs> I became brutal. Second, you have to have mandatory counseling. How? Now, right now they have counseling. If a, a supervisor sees an officer and he thinks he should go to counseling, he can mandate it. A couple of reasons they don't. Number one, the supervisor wants to be liked. And if that supervisor mandates somebody to counseling, all the other cops know that cop now has a stigma. He had to go, there's something mentally wrong with him. So all the cops think, is my supervisor going to send me for mental counseling? So if you make it, oh, and by the way, a former president, of the Fraternal Order of Police, the Philadelphia Union, he said when he was, they were bargaining with the city, the city wanted a counseling program. He said the only, and this is an example that the president of the union said. So all the cops look up to the president of the union, more than the, the police commissioner. He said the only stress program a cop needs is a shot and a mug of beer. What message got a, see that macho image? No cop is going to say, hey, I need help. Right. So if it's mandatory, like every three months, a ghetto cop is mandated to go to counseling, it loses that stigma. Because all the cops know, well, it's mandated. And what else would you expect from an organization that considers itself a frat house of cops, right? Feeling bad about shooting an innocent black guy on the streets? Pussy, get that keg stand in to drown those feelings. So now we're going to have a bunch of drunk cops looking at uh, looking at their enemies, a.k.a. us, with beer goggles, right? As they're arresting us for uh, something that doesn't deserve a prison sentence, they're going to be asking us out on a date, too. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure that the Me Too movement's head is now going to explode. Captain Ray Lewis also addresses the fact that the test they have to take at the academy is to blame. In a 500-question test, if they score too high on empathy and compassion, they get rejected. So no goofy, fun-loving cops like the film Police Academy has to offer. No, it's just a bunch of dudes who are eating testosterone for breakfast instead of the donuts they're stereotypically supposed to be. The theory is they won't be able to handle the intensity of the job because their feelings will prevent you from arresting people and corporations won't get to do whatever they want. 
it is strange that nurses see more gore and blood and semen than cops do, but we want them to be more compassionate and empathetic. So why not cops, right? Unless this is a racially motivated agenda. Okay, I, I mean, when was the last time you heard of a nurse kill someone in the waiting room just because they were black, right? No, no seriously, I, I am asking that question. If, if there is a story out there, please, please tell me. And before everybody freaks out and claims that I'm saying all cops are racist, I'm not. I'm just saying the system that they are hired to protect is racist. And I know, you know, I think we all know in the recent years there's been an uptick, an increase of police brutality videos of cops shooting innocent people. A lot of them are black people. But that's not to say that white people, natives, Mexicans, all don't get shot by the cops because... They do. But the reason why it's a big deal is because there are less black people and Mexicans in America than white people, right? And there's definitely less Native Americans in America than white people. And yes, that is an insane sentence, but history makes it factual. So it's a statistics game. And if we actually encourage cops to get good grades on the policing test, uh, maybe we'd have less of an issue with uh, math and brutality. With all these police shootings in America, I mean, the minority communities are becoming an endangered species here, right? A and if, if this continues, skin color be damned. We're all going to be an endangered species. And then the only ones that'll be left are the elites who will eventually become these half-human, half-dollar bill hybrid creature that sustains itself by eating the concept of exploitation. And this is the legacy of the history of policing in America, right? It was initially introduced as deputized citizens who were part of a slave patrol. Look at the history of policing. I mean, probably the first most modern policing sort of force in America was in Charleston, South Carolina. And it was set up sort of as people might imagine, sort of specifically around the issue of slave insurrection. Some of the first organized patrol police style forces were organized more broadly in the South and in the slave going territories as these so-called slave patrols that were designed to deputize a certain subset of the population to control the movement of slaves. And we see so much of our modern policing system coming out of these models, coming out of this heritage and coming out of this culture. And I think what we've seen sort of from that moment on is that policing is used as an institution of social control in the United States of America. We saw it certainly during slavery. We saw it again during Jim Crow with sort of the juridical uh, empowerment of legal police forces in an apartheid style regime in the South. Uh, we also saw it in the North in many of these same times, even though it was more de facto din de jour, the way the police were used to police the so-called ghettos, the so-called slums to keep black America trapped in tiny little sectors of the major cities or a handful of tiny little sectors where people were moving into on to what we see today which is slightly different because it's an institution of social control based not on maintaining a labor force but based on the reality of so many uh individuals in the black community having become superfluous population as it were so this becomes the escalation of that history some cops deep down might think that they're still rounding up slaves for their landowning masters and all of this is causing the society and uh, the citizens to lose trust in cops day in and day out. I mean, there's a lot of accounts of cops lying on the stand. New York City police officer Pedro Serrano told the New York Times that the force calls it testa lying, which is also what college boys call it when someone lies about how big their balls are. You, you, you don't want to know how they find out. It, it's... It, it's so gross that nurses are disturbed by it. But this perjury is a result of the encouraged PTSD that cops have to go through when they look at citizens as the enemy and are at constant war with the people, right? The cops that are practicing perjury never outgrew the crying wolf phase of their life, right? Eventually, we're all going to stop believing you. And in fact, a lot of us have. And... The wolf community is really pissed off that these cops are culturally appropriating them.
Okay, real cultural appropriation is just the manifest destiny of ideas. And this is a real bummer for lawyers, you know? I mean, they had uh, the, this, this liar thing on lock, you know? I mean, they w got t-shirts. What are they going to do with hundreds and thousands of t-shirts that says lion for laws with a picture of, of Lady Liberty just snoozing on a futon? Huh? They can't just give it to third world countries. These aren't Super Bowl t-shirts. So aside from the idea of mandated counseling, which would take the stigma away from people receiving help, there are other more radical ideas on reforming the police. The NEAR Act would change the way policing and violence is looked at on all levels. Right? The Neighborhood Engagement Achieves Results Act will put the demands of policing within the communities themselves instead of the cops that need to rebuild some trust. A major change that makes the NEAR Act as a positive way to look at community policing as a viable option is the fact that violence is a public health issue. They use the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement to help folks that might be at risk. The community crime prevention team would find links between behavioral and mental health issues to and address these issues appropriately. In the hands of the community, folks can be protected and served. Now, most of us would say that the cops are supposed to be part of the community, and even if that was true, they're not anymore. You know, the cops that are stationed in a neighborhood aren't from there so they don't know the politics and nuance of those streets right to them they're all strangers that are at risk of falling prey to liberal laws which are just a gateway to bigger crimes the near act looks at the source of police violence as the police themselves and instead of relying on a system to fix their mistakes they are taking it upon themselves to look after each other and this begs the question to be asked, do we even need the police? I would say in the form it's in now, no. I mean, that's like asking if you want McDonald's to keep putting ammonia in your hamburger. Real thing. But the NEAR Act changes what the idea of policing is, like how McDonald's has officially changed what a burger and the meaning of food is. The NEAR Act is a true reform to the idea of policing that works from the outside to maybe change the internals of a broken system, while McDonald's will continue to break you from the inside out. And realistically, thanks to the NEAR Act, who knows their community better than those that are living in it? The NEAR Act would also address the idea that we can probably stop crime. Right? Not just predict it, but look at the causes of it and try to fix those problems. Violence is really a public health issue. And just like the same way we can solve any disease by looking at what are the enzymes and the like that are at the basis of it and figure out how to counteract them, we can look at what causes quote unquote crime, especially violent crime, and get in front of the problem by dealing with the situations and the social context that led people to making certain uh, uh, choices. So we're right, this is from poverty pressures from hypergendered situations, the importance of basic needs and income can all be addressed as a group. Uh, well, what does it mean to have a world where first and foremost, every person has what they need and to some degree based on what we can produce, what they want, right? How do we reduce the need of people to feel like they need to victimize others to survive? What and now there will also be an armed community self-defense group to protect people from the three to 4,000 bigoted right-wing militias that politicians seem to be supporting because we haven't stopped all crimes yet. I mentioned the Huey B. Newton Gun Club, which is a relatively small group of people focused on community empowerment, and they're treated as a terrorist organization, where in Oregon you have three, 4,000 strong militias where they have state senators that are affiliated with them, and it's not considered controversial. So I think that's the context we have to consider uh, community self-defense in. Uh, it's the context of a real threat to a lot of communities, but I think it's also a context that, you know, 
in that context, gun ownership is very different. And it's it's part of a disciplined, organized, political, conscious movement that is very different than what we see, which is, I think, a very willy-nilly approach to either people who live on the suburbs who just are racist and fear robberies and who own guns or people in many of our oppressed communities who feel the need to own a gun to either stay safe or to conduct their business. And a lot of those nuances have to be dealt with, I think, outside of the context of gun control. If we look at the police as a force that is in place by elites suffering from PTSD, we can let them take a little bit of a break to recover, right? Communities can make better decisions for themselves instead of out of touch rich people that are not vested in our communities or our people, right? These reforms are, are, are more work on our part, but it's worth it. And we can do it as long as we help each other instead of being convinced that we constantly have to be at war amongst each other. That has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the, the episode. Uh, we've got a lot more coming up in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but if you would like to support Forkful of Noodles, uh, this is what I do full time. I uh, uh, tour with comedy. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian that tours full time and I create comedy content full time. If you would like to support these things, please donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, all of that starts at $2 a month. All of my stuff is going to be available for free. There's very little that's going to be behind a paywall. But if you would like to show appreciation and financially support this show, because uh, it's a lot of work to produce a show like this every single week, uh, you can donate to my Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, if you can't support this show financially, I completely understand. Uh, but a great way to help this show is by sharing. Share it with some friends. Share it with some enemies. Share it with anybody you think would enjoy content like this. Uh, and if you would like to, uh, you can follow me. You can like my Facebook page. You can give this video a thumbs up. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Krishmohanhaha. Uh, and you can check out my website, ramennoodlescomedy.com. I have live stand-up comedy shows coming up in Lexington, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, Knoxville, Tennessee. I will be in Cincinnati, Ohio, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Frederick, Maryland, Williamsburg, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. I'm going to be all over the place, you guys. Come hang out with me. Come check out the full hour of comedy that I am working on. Uh, you can check out my entire tour schedule at ramennoodlescomedy.com. We've got lots more Fork Full of Noodles coming up. I'm very excited to be back. Like I said, if you want to support this show, share the hell out of it. Give it a like uh, and donate to the Patreon at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha. Uh, check out all of the links below. Sign up for the email list to get updates uh, every single week or every single month to find out what's going on with me. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for supporting and sharing uh, to all of the people that are already patrons, thank you guys so much for, for donating. Uh, it, it means a lot. Every little bit helps. But till the next video, uh, thanks for getting into it, and we'll see you on the road.